off. I think there's cars in this way. Yes, okay. Okay, there's the mother. Now look at this. Look, they've pulled the skin to the side there. Yeah. There's just a lot of bones there and everything. Right, shall we look for a place to land? Today in Africa, a bitter war is being fought. Both man and beast are dying. And the enemies are greed, corruption, and ignorance. The battle is being waged over the black rhino, sought by poachers for its valuable horn. In the past 15 years, over 95% of the animals have been slaughtered. Each day, Ranger Dolph Sassin patrols the Zambezi Valley. But for this mother and calf, he was too late. A lot of people would say, what does rhino do to the bush? As a bushman, you can turn around and say, rhino has been created by God as part of creation. We need it to look at it. It's a beautiful animal, and we can uh, live side by side. You do not want to show to your children one day an elef how an elephant or a rhino look in a storybook. That's not what it, life is all about. Life is not a storybook, it's a reality. For 45 million years, one of the planet's most primitive mammals wandered the plains and forests of the world with little to fear. The rhino has few natural enemies, but that role has now been filled by man. More than 30 species of rhinoceros once existed. Today, there are only five, all endangered. In Asia, the Javan, Sumatran, and Indian rhinos are down to critical levels. In Africa, the white rhino is somewhat more stable, closely confined in a few well-guarded South African reserves. But the black rhino is hurtling towards extinction. If, as we say, in the early 70s, there were 65,000 rhino on the continent, we are down to 4,500 now. That's an indictment upon somebody or a group of people or nations come down throughout Africa, this disease, this cancerous situation, plundering the wildlife of Africa. Through the years, the black rhino had already been depleted through much of its range. It is the recent wave of slaughter, though, which has devastated the animal. Starting in the early 70s, poachers swept through East Africa, all but wiping out the populations of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, and Mozambique. Now they have begun to threaten Zimbabwe. In 1977, the situation took an even more severe turn for the worse in Kenya's Meru National Park. In one three-month period, the toll on the rhinos reached 53, and rangers began to be attacked and killed by armed Somali poachers. Peter Jenkins was the park's warden during that time. When I went to the Meru Park, we had a population of black rhino between 200 and 250. And then in the late 70s, we were hit by a different type of poacher. This was the shifter poacher with his automatic. And when I left Meru in 81, the population was down to about 25. Today it's three.
The beginning of the rhino's decline can be traced back to the mid-19th century. Modern guns were introduced into Africa, and killing became easy, efficient, and popular. Some Europeans developed a taste for rhino meat. Others hunted for the sheer sport of it. When a rhino charges a man, that's nothing. But when a man charges a rhino, that's news. So here you see the tables reversed. We are now in a district six with rhino. Ozzy dislikes rhinos more than any animal on earth. For years they have been chasing her. And here was a chance to give them a taste of their own medicine. Mr. Rhino is public enemy number one in Africa. He's afraid of nothing. If your first shot doesn't stop him, good night. It is not hunting, however, that poses the great threat to the rhinoceros. Instead, it is the demand for the horn. Ironically, the very feature of the animal that evolved for its defense may bring about its extinction. Though hard and strong like bone, the horn is made of keratin, like the human fingernail. It grows throughout the rhino's life at a rate of about three inches a year. On a full-grown adult, it may reach over four feet. For thousands of years, rhino horn powder has been a treasured commodity in the Far East. Ancient oriental tradition views it as an effective fever reducer and an indispensable cure-all. The use of rhino horn as an aphrodisiac has been greatly exaggerated and is found only in parts of western India. As early as the 16th century, rhino horn powder was recommended in a classic encyclopedia of Chinese medicine, still widely consulted today. The best horn is from a freshly killed male. Black is better than white. The tip has the most virtue. Pregnant women should not take the powder or they will miscarry. Modern medicine considers the claims highly unlikely and almost all Far Eastern countries have officially banned the importation of rhino horn. Still, the local market flourishes. In the back streets of Taipei, Bangkok and other Asian cities, African rhino horn retails for up to $7,000 per pound. For the past decade, the export of rhino horn has been banned in most African countries, but smuggling continues to the dismay of conservationists. Back in the 1970s, when there was very little effort to control the trade, the outlets were very diffuse indeed, going out on aircraft, on boats, and perhaps overland as well. But nowadays I think that the routes have become rather more confined, and most countries seem to point a finger at Burundi as the major exit point in Africa for rhino horn. So I believe a very large proportion must be going out from this one country. But we also know from countries like Zimbabwe and Tanzania, that a certain amount of rhino horn has gone out in diplomatic pouches. It's almost certainly an international um, illegal network, if you like, um, involving corrupt government officials, um, corrupt businessmen, and corrupt politicians. And it's this sort of triangular mafia-like alliance um, which has made it so powerful. It's not only affected um, rhino, it's also affected elephant and ivory, the, the two are very closely linked. Throughout history, the port of Mombasa, Kenya, has been a center for many kinds of illegal trade. Rhino horn, leopard skins, gold, ivory. Each dealer has his specialty. This pile of ivory, taken from 500 elephants, was hidden in falsely labeled spice crates 
It was seized by Kenyan customs officials while awaiting shipment to the Middle East. The route is an old one. For thousands of years, Arab dhows have sailed these waters, sometimes with valuable contraband aboard. In this way, the horn of countless slaughtered rhino had made their way across the sea. In recent years, the horn has often ended its journey in North Yemen. It is here that one more damaging twist to the black rhino story has been added. The oil boom of the early 70s created lucrative work for migrant Yemeni laborers in Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. For the first time, the workers had ready cash to spend on luxuries, including the ultimate symbol of virility, the rhino horn dagger, or jambia. The discovery of the new threat to the rhino was made by Kenyan-based geographer Esmond Bradley Martin. I first came into uh, North Yemen in 1978 uh, when I was doing a general sort of survey of the country and discovered at that time that perhaps 50% of all the rhino horn in the world was coming up here to Sana'a for the making of dagger handles. The rhino horn handle, once reserved for the aristocracy, is treasured far above alternatives like cow or water buffalo. A fine antique may sell for $15,000. When polished, the horn takes on an amber opalescence, greatly admired for its subtle beauty. Esmond Bradley Martin began an international campaign to stop the rhino horn trade, encouraging the use of substitutes. After some 10 years, his work is showing signs of success. International trade has slowed in many Eastern countries. And since 1985, the North Yemeni government has been enforcing a ban on importation but it's not nearly enough. Where there is profit, men will trade. The middleman, by transporting the horn from the smuggler to the dealer, keeps business going briskly. I will buy for about $700 per kilo and sell for about $1,400 per kilogram. So I make a profit of about $700. The diplomats who smuggle rhino horn come mostly from Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, South Korea. I saw rhino in Nairobi. I like it. I like rhino. Despite the rhino's size and fierce reputation, it is sadly easy to track, find, and kill. Its thick hide offers no protection against bullets, and its behavior patterns are too predictable to elude the determined poacher.
In its simple daily routine, the black rhino uses its prehensile lip to tear off the leaves of the prickly acacia bushes and other scrubby plants. A solitary creature, it lives on a home range of from 1 to 12 square miles. The rhino's territory may overlap with another of its species, but it is persistent in marking its range. The animals spray urine or track their dung across the area and so spread their scent. Contrary to appearances, the rhinoceros is a peaceful being and only rarely takes exception to the occasional trespasser. Although it can hear and smell acutely, its eyesight is poor. Help comes in the form of the oxpecker, which serves as a lookout. In Swahili, the oxpecker is known as Askari Wakifaru, the rhino's policeman. When alerted by its tiny bodyguard, the rhino may panic and run. But since it is both curious and nearsighted, it may be enticed from the bush sometimes fatally, by the human voice mimicking its call. The first man to devote his life to the study of rhino behavior was John Goddard. While living in Tanzania's Angoro Angoro crater during the 1960s, he developed a genuine affection for his lumbering, primitive subjects. Goddard was deeply committed to his work, regardless of the hazards. Even a tranquilized rhino can be dangerous. Weighing up to one and a half tons, an adult bull represents a serious threat. Venting joined in P2 between cuts. Piece three, dentine almost joined between cusps. For seven years, Goddard carried out exhaustive field work, recording each minute feature of the rhino's appearance and behavior. Sixteen years after Goddard's own death at the age of 35, the number of rhino in his research area had plummeted from 108 to about 20. Many were the victims of poachers. In the vast expanse of East Africa's savanna, protection of the rhino has proved impossible. Bob Oguya, warden of Kenya's Meru Park since 1983, has one plane and 30 men to patrol 350 square miles. The problem we are facing is that these fellows are with their automatics and our people with the single action 303s. It's very difficult for us uh, to match them. And in most cases, we lose them because with their type of uh, firearms and with our types of firearms, uh, they end up escaping our drug net. The rangers are at serious personal risk from the armed poachers. Their camel patrols stay out for weeks at a time, in touch only by radio with park headquarters. Thank 
Despite the men's vulnerability and outdated equipment, they are dedicated and loyal, even in the face of tragedy. In December, we lost our sergeant to the poacher's bullets. We saw him die. Without adequate weapons, we were helpless. Too many of our men have fallen because we could not defend ourselves. If we had automatics instead of 303s, we wouldn't be losing our people. With the rhino population at such critical levels throughout Africa, every animal is important. In Kenya's Masai Mara Reserve, rangers mounted round-the-clock protection for this mother and calf, shooting several lions who came too close. Worried, the rangers moved the family to safer ground. <laughs> the calf was better protected, but his mother kept trying to get back to her old territory, leaving her baby open to attack. The lions seized their chance. After the incident, the rangers turned to Daphne Sheldrick, who raises wounded and orphaned animals. On one of the occasions that she was away, the lions got in and they caught him and actually made a real mess of him. Fortunately, they were young lions and they weren't very experienced, but they certainly chewed him up very, very badly and he was dumped on my doorstep, more dead than alive. I must say he's a fantastically plucky little rhino. In fact, his mother's a very placid, dozy old cow, so I expect this has made him have to be slightly more alert. The first thing we had to do, of course, was get a friend because he'd been through tremendous trauma. So we got the sheep. They've been good friends ever since, and wherever Sam goes, so the sheep follows, and they play together and wander around together, and he'll just grow up here until he's all weaned off milk, and then we'll have to send him somewhere to be a wild rhino. Little Sam was lucky. These rangers saved his life. Other rhinos have been less fortunate, poached by the very men paid to protect them. The shadow of corruption has fallen across much of Africa, and Kenya has had her share of officials who have cashed in on illegal rhino horn trade. It became so bad during the late 1970s that a major international scandal centering on the president's wife erupted and as a result of that the Kenya government was so severely embarrassed that it closed trade in all wildlife products and that did have a very immediate effect on the revival of certain species but the two species which showed no revival whatsoever were the main trophy species elephants and rhinos and by the early 1980s it became clear once again that major elements within the wildlife department, ex-game department people, were once again very evolved, involved in poaching. All of this might now change with the appointment of a new director of the wildlife department. That is Perez Alinda, who was former director of the National Park Service. And this has created a tremendous enthusiasm throughout Kenya. And we feel that this is just in time 
to revive what is our most important effort, and that's a major plan to save the rhinos in Kenya. The problem of human beings is everywhere. We have found people whom, who are colluding with criminal elements. They have been prosecuted. They have been imprisoned. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, I cannot and I will not compromise with or collude with the people who are out to do things that will harm conservation and wildlife in this country. We cannot compromise with sin, I'm afraid. The sin is not always hard to understand. Within the poverty-stricken rural communities of Africa, there is a powerful incentive to poach. A family may be lucky to earn $20 a month. Each member of a rhino poaching gang may earn $100 or $200 per raid, a year's income. Although the big money is made by the middlemen, dealers, and corrupt officials, the pay is bountiful by local standards. One Kenyan who has fought against poaching in a very personal way is Michael Werike. Known throughout East Africa as the Rhino Man, he has walked more than 1,400 miles and raised over $60,000 on his crusade to inform Africans of the threat to the black rhino. People who are very hospitable, very concerned about my welfare, not only my welfare alone, but even that of my snake, which is a very, very strange thing. Africans are very scared of snakes. And to have people showing so much concern about an animal they fear so much is a very touching thing. The local people are just as concerned about the wildlife, about the environment, just like any other people. And I think it is very important that wildlife awareness should be taken to the people, for it's them who have the final say. And they are ready to cooperate, provided that they're given the right information, the right encouragement. Even with the work of dedicated men like Warike, Kenya's war to save the wild rhino has essentially been lost. Now its best hope for salvation may be the fenced sanctuary. Although critics view them as glorified zoos, they are far easier to manage than the huge reserves. In some cases, it is private citizens who have taken up the cause. Solio Ranch in the foothills of Mount Kenya is owned by Cortland and Claude Parfitt. In 1970, using their own funds, they encircled 15,000 acres with a high-cost, specially designed fence, creating a haven for Africa's embattled wildlife. Over a 10-year period, they introduced 23 black rhino and 16 whites. Protected, the animals thrived. In less than 20 years, the number of black rhino had quadrupled. Now Solio had a most unusual problem, overpopulation. The Parfits gave 15 of the black rhino to the Kenyan government's first enclosed sanctuary, 
at Nakuru National Park. Transporting the animals to their new home is a huge undertaking. The selected rhino are located from the air. Okay, dart is in. Keep it in sight. It's running south. A vet walks to within 40 feet of the unsuspecting animal before using his tranquilizer gun. A new, fast-acting drug brings the rhinoceros down in minutes. But great care must be taken to prevent it from injuring itself. A second injection of antibiotics prevents infection in the dart gun wound. <laughs> okay, watch your haste. This is cherry but ten up. You must. Though unceremonious, this rhino's awakening is the next step in his relocation. Animals are kept in holding pens for about two weeks to overcome the stress of capture. Soon, though, this young bull will be installed among the tourists and flamingos of Nakuru. <laughs> difficult journey for him, but it is here that he can do the most to help save his species. <laughs> 
Although the rhino may be well protected in fenced sanctuaries, the situation creates another problem, in breeding. Wildlife biologist Rob Brett lives and works in Kenya on a remote private reserve. He is closely observing the animals in an effort to find a solution. Although rhino have been known about, wondered at, admired, hated for such a long period, we know virtually nothing about their breeding. Such basic things as what turns rhino on, what makes them breed at optimum rates. It is crucial that we find out as much about this sort of behavior of rhino in order to conserve them under the new conditions that exist. Their favored habitat is bush. They are generally nocturnal. They spend most of the day asleep. And to observe the nitty gritty of rhino sexual behavior takes, first of all, a lot of patience and a great deal of interest. It's really very, very basic work employing the minimum of equipment, uh, a mixture between very low-tech, if you like, work and very high-tech. I am out at dawn every morning looking for individual rhino from which to take data. So well does Brett know his subjects that he can identify every rhino on the reserve from the lines and wrinkles of its footprint. He takes urine samples left from each animal to determine their hormonal levels, identifying the pregnant females and dominant males. While the black rhino is extremely secretive about its mating habits, the white rhino, like these on Solio Ranch, are less inhibited. This dominant male has asserted his influence and now begins his courtship, which may last for many days. He approaches the female and rests his head on her rump. His interest may not be initially returned. But his persistence eventually pays off, and mating occurs, sometimes lasting over an hour. Although rhinos are not monogamous, the female usually mates with the dominant male in the area. Afterwards, the pair go their separate ways. If impregnated, the female will not give birth for approximately 16 to 18 months, delivering only one calf at a time. A newborn rhino, which weighs up to 120 pounds, will stay close to its mother until she has a new calf for some two to four years. The rhinoceros, slow to reproduce and quick to die, faces an uphill struggle. In the wild, there are so few left that some never find a suitable mate. In Kenya and elsewhere, the fight becomes increasingly grim and ever more complex. It can be argued that the numbers of rhino are very low, but I think it would be negligence on behalf of the world to just turn their backs on this country now and say, all is lost, there are only 400 rhino left, they're not worth saving. We have had long years of experience with poaching, which is what Zimbabwe's having now, armed poachers. Zimbabwe's getting it for the first time. I wonder 
whether they're going to actually be able to save their rhino by just having armed um, patrols and shootouts. I know in Kenya that there are fighting armed gangs there and there are contacts taking place. But we've, right from the onset, have taken on this task as a war and not as a conservation exercise purely and simply. The situation bears a more than passing resemblance to full-fledged guerrilla combat. It is a deadly serious mission. Glenn Tatham commands Operation Stronghold from a camp on the Zambezi River in Zimbabwe, where he protects the last large wild rhino population left in the world. The project involved moving 250 rhino, one-third of the valley's population, to safer ground. The fight to protect the rest is a desperate one. Rangers live year-round in camp with their families, who realize that some of the men may die in armed conflict. What we're doing here is fight the poachers. Every day that a group of poachers are in here, they are potentially able to kill two or three or maybe even four rhino. One group killed six rhino one morning here, here in the Zambezi Valley. To our north of Zambia, and these poachers are crossing from there to here. The river is the, the international boundary, but there's no barrier such as this. Two border posts on the section of the river. We cannot cover 150 miles of river frontage here every day of the year. It's an impossibility. You'd need more than a division of men to do that. Even then, because of the bush warfare that we're fighting, it's an impossibility. As in Kenya, the odds are staggering and the danger is real. Operation Stronghold is just 100 men to patrol more than 7,500 square miles. Many of the rangers are veterans from opposite sides of Zimbabwe's war of independence, now fighting together against a common enemy. Facing heavily armed Zambian-based poachers, the rangers shoot to kill with the government's consent. Since 1985, more than 30 poachers have been shot dead and at least 20 taken prisoner. In the same period, some 330 rhino have died. Until the network of dealers and middlemen is broken, Zimbabwe's rangers know they can do little more than stem the tide. Privately, many wonder how long it can go on. We've got people here who've been in the bush for two years. They go out for 20 days in a month. They occasionally have success. But it's very, very demanding on, on them physically. It's demanding on their families. It's demanding on... on on their well-being. They, they buoy it up with enthusiasm every time you, you have a successful contact and, and perhaps this is a good, good enough reason to have a contact is to boost enthusiasm if no other reason. One contact killed and uh, you've captured, you've recovered uh, one one and what direction is the other poacher running to over? No problem, as soon as the chopper arrives, we will get it to yours and then you can fly. Okay, so the big thing is now to get hold of Alistair. If, he, if he's going to be on the ground for too long, I have to go and fly over him and pick him up. I mean, to go and alert him. All right. One down, one running. <laughs> Can't we get them in and start leapfrogging her? The support units are on their way now and they will be cutting spore from Vundu to the road. 401 is sending down six details to 70.
And the one, as I said, was had been shot on the groin, was in fact bleeding. I don't know how he in fact got as far as he had. He scrabbled about 15 paces on his on his stomach and um, died there. It all happened so very quickly. One, one tends just to pick up little images of, of what was happening rather than <laughs> as an overall thing. You, you get images of, of, of rounds from the people behind you, the, the expended cartridge cases landing on your head. <laughs> The gang had killed four rhino in as many days. Each poacher had risked his life for a few hundred dollars. The rangers know that Zimbabwe is the last stand for the wild black rhino. Still, the dilemma they face is a terrible one. One often wonders about the human life for a rhino life. Um, and at this stage, it's a human life for about 20 rhino lives. Um, the morality is perhaps secondary to the fact that there doesn't seem to be any other way in which we can in fact stop these blokes from getting away and getting back. A group of poachers will come into the country. They'll start killing rhinos. We've got to react to that. And one must never forget the central objective of this whole exercise, this whole operation, is save the rhino. We are not manhunters. We're not mercenaries, we are here as conservationists. But desperate situations require desperate measures. No, I see there's no joy in killing people. But it's, uh, it's a job, and uh, quite obviously we're just pawns on either side for men who are just exploiting um, people to, to make himself rich. <laughs> Forty-five million years of nature, unraveled by man in an evolutionary microsecond. Still, the rhinoceros can be saved. If a major international effort were mounted to stop the poachers, the rhino would almost certainly bounce back. But until the incentive to kill is removed, the profit for the poachers, middlemen and dealers, the battle will go on. If the fight is lost, the rhino will be doomed to exist only as a drawing in a child's picture book of things that once were and are no more.